Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson 109, we'll talk about base transactions and eventual consistency. When we talk about transactions, normally we refer to what are called ACID transactions, database transactions, where we do a commit and also a rollback. ACID, defined as atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, guarantee that multiple updates, inserts, or actions, write actions to a database will all be kept in sync, and that's consistency, uh, will be durable, meaning it's guaranteed that all of those will be saved, and that they will be isolated um, from prying eyes until I do a commit on all of that information. And this is how for three plus decades uh, we've been doing transactions. But in distributed architecture, we have something called base transactions. Now, I can purchase or download an ACID transaction manager, what's called a database transaction manager, or a framework, um, but I can't do that with base. Base is really a technique within distributed architecture to manage transactions. And it stands for basic availability, soft state, and eventual consistency. The BA, basic availability part, assumes within the scope of managing a distributed transaction and that all the services will have at least some basic level of availability. For example, a minimum of three nines of availability. Soft state really refers, that's the S part of base, to the transit of data, for example, from source to target, or uh, the inconsistency between data sources. The E stands for eventual consistency. Uh, this is uh, eventually every data source involved in that transaction will be consistent. And what I wanted to focus on in this lesson as part of base transactions were those patterns of eventual consistency. How will everything become consistent? And there really are three different patterns I want to show you. The first is called background synchronization. Uh, the second is request-based synchronization. And the third is event-based. I want to show you each of these patterns, but let's look at a scenario first that we can apply all three of these patterns on to look at the pros and cons and trade-offs of them. So our scenario is as follows. We have a website that has three services here, a customer information service, a wish list service, and preferences. Now, I happen to be a customer in this website, so they have all my demographic or profile information. I've got a wish list and I also have preferences, but I haven't used it in a while, so I want to unsubscribe. So we want to do a delete of customer123. That's me. So the customer information service gets that information or gets that request from the API, deletes that customer, responds back, and says, so sorry to see you go, and now we are left in an inconsistent state. Let's apply all three of these patterns and see how to fix this problem. Uh, the first of those patterns is something called background synchronization, where we have some sort of external process. This could be a batch job. It could be something that wakes up on a cron every two hours. Um, but the point is, what it does is it's responsible for synchronizing all the data sources. And so it takes ownership of that. Let me show you how this works. Let's do our delete of customer123, the customer information service. It receives that request, deletes the customer, and sends the response back. Pretty good responsiveness here. Now, let's say that was at 11 o'clock. In the middle of the night, the batch process wakes up. It detects that customer123 has been deleted and then correspondingly removes it from the other data sources, therefore keeping all the data in sync. You know, this is one of those, in my opinion, anti-patterns. Something that seems like a good idea at the time, but generally leads you down a bad path, gets you into trouble. The reason I don't like this pattern is because it completely couples all of the data together. We lose the bounded context. If the bounded context is not important to us and we're sharing data everywhere, this is where this pattern is usually applied. However, in architectures like microservices, we do have well-formed bounded contexts. Every service owns its own data. 
And when I start sharing that data with external processes, I break those bounding contexts. Two bad things, by the way, happen with the background synchronization. The first is change control. Any change to those three databases from a schema standpoint will usually require a change in the SQL within the background process as well. So agility kind of goes out the door. It's very hard to test all that. Um, but the second problem is even worse than the first. You see, let's take the wish list service in the middle. We don't actually delete your wish list. And what we do is we do what's called a soft delete. It stays out there with a timer associated with it for six months, just in case you come back. Then your wish list is restored. After six months, then we delete it. Now that business logic is within the wish list service, but guess what? It's also in that background process. And so you can start to see the problems with background synchronization. Uh, really the bottom line is that it does break the bounded context, which is usually not a good thing. Another approach which preserves the bounded context is something called the request-based synchronization. Now here, let's do our delete. The customer information service does a delete, but it says, hold on a second, uh, wait, wait on customer, just hold on. I have to do some cleanup before you go. And so now the customer information service sends a request to wish list and says, can you please delete this customer? Yep. Sends an information to preferences, can you delete it? So on and so forth. Then responds back to the customer. This is my least favorite pattern of eventual consistency. It is riddled with problems. Response times are impacted because now the customer has to wait for all this to happen. Uh, data consistency and integrity is also impacted because suppose that uh, the customer preferences service fails or isn't available. I can't restart this transaction. I've already deleted and committed data in other data sources. And so now I'm kind of stuck. Also, it requires the customer information service to really know about all other services needed. What if there were 100 customer services, everybody? That's a lot to coordinate. And the probability that something's going to fail is just too high. And the problem is we have no other means of consistency. This is the eventual consistency. <clears throat> I will say I was in a shop, uh, a company that was doing request based and I brought up this issue and well, <clears throat> they did say, no problem. We have a background process just in case that happens. And so <laughs> this company actually combined both the background and the request base together. <laughs> and so not only did they not have any bounded contexts, but response times and error rates were so high. Now let me show you a pattern that I like best that I think actually works most effectively with eventual consistency, and that's the event-based synchronization. And so what we have is a topic with durable subscribers. A durable subscriber is essentially the same thing as having a persistent queue within a topic. In other words, the wish list and preferences as durable subscribers will be guaranteed to get any message I publish or broadcast to that topic. And the point is, if they're up, if they're down, it doesn't matter. If they're down, when they come back up, they will receive the message. Let's run our through our scenario here. We delete a customer, customer information service deletes it, does a commit, and says, well, hold on, all I need to do is publish a message to a topic, an event that says, customer123 has been deleted, and my work here is done. Notice here, response time is fairly good. I've only impacted it just by one additional task, which is to publish a message to a topic. Customer information service doesn't need to know about the rest of the system. This is the wonderful thing about event-driven architecture. And so now the wish list and customer preferences, being durable subscribers, receive that information. They do whatever they need to do to react, react or respond to that event. And now we are in a consistent state. Now you might ask, well, wait a minute, Mark. What if preferences fails or can't actually do a delete? 
I've anticipated that question. And in lesson 81, I talk about a very a pattern called workflow event pattern in event-driven architecture, which is a way of programmatically handling asynchronous events that do fail. And so I'd encourage you for that error handling piece to take a look at lesson 81. So for more information, uh, you could certainly go to our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture. A lot of this stuff is in there, and that was published last year in 2020. Um, also, great resources on developer2architect.com, in particular, uh, Software Architecture Monday, where these lessons are actually housed. Every two weeks, I do another lesson in software architecture. And so this has been Lesson 109, uh, Base Transactions and Eventual Consistency. I hope that gave you uh, some aspect of what these sagas and transactions and stuff are about when we have multiple services uh, involved in that transaction. And so thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned in two weeks for the next lesson in software architecture. Thank you.